My name is Orla Freel. I'm a senior physiotherapist in the National Rehab Hospital Seating Clinic. And today, together with my colleague Shanda Ronglo, senior OT in the National Rehab Hospital Seating Clinic, we're going to be talking to you about wheelchairs and seating and selecting the right chair for you. So just to give you an overview of the aims of today's session, we're going to provide you with an insight into what we do in the National Rehab Hospital Seating Clinic Service. We're going to discuss different types of wheelchairs and cushions that are available and trying to select the right one for you. And we're going to enable listeners to hopefully make more informed choices regarding wheelchair cushion and components. And then we're going to discuss prevention of pressure injury and how to select the right cushion for you. So just to give you a little bit of background in terms of the seating clinic here at the NRH, it's an interdisciplinary clinic comprising of OT, physio and wheelchair technician, which started in 2015. Prior to 2015, the seating assessments and prescriptions were carried out as an integral element of the patient's therapy program, with the prescriptions and the assessments being carried out by the treating physiotherapist. A need for the development of a specialised interdisciplinary clinic was identified jointly by the physio and OT departments and thus the IDT clinic was born in 2015. We have quite a diverse client group, so it includes those with newly acquired brain injury, spinal cord injury, amputations and paediatrics. And the clinic is primarily for individuals who require their first manual wheelchair to facilitate participation in the community and discharge from the NRH. So what do we do? We provide a full assessment and that's including a discussion around what the expectations and goals are for that individual and a supine and seated assessment. We provide equipment trials where appropriate. So for different individuals, they might have to try different backrests, different cushions, different chairs even. And then following on from equipment trials, if they're needed, we proceed to prescribe and order products. And then once all the equipment is in, we provide fitting of equipment and training in the use of the equipment to each client or family member and or treating therapist at the time of issue. So we offer pressure mapping based on the clinical needs of the individual if required. And we provide handover of documentation to, to local community therapists for follow up. So anybody that has come through the National Rehab Hospital Seating Clinic will have a very detailed file detailing all of their assessments, any equipment trials, their final prescription and details of what happened on the day of fitting or issuing of the equipment. And currently there is no seating clinic service for outpatients at present time. And that's what makes the handover and communication with our colleagues in the community so important. In terms of how our assessments and prescriptions are guided, they're guided very much by the ICF model. So that's the International Classification for Functioning, Disability and Health. So it's a common international language used to assess somebody's function in the context of a health condition such as spinal cord injury. Um, by using this I suppose this structured model, it allows us to assess somebody's function and participation by looking at their impairments, activities and participation. So, for example, by impairments, we consider things like do they have impaired balance? Do they have preserved upper limb function or difficulties with their function in their upper limbs that will impact their ability to push? What are their activity restrictions like? So. What's their level of transferability? Are they using hoist? Can they do a, a pivot transfer or a lateral transfer? Because again, sometimes that can guide the type of chair that we go for. And finally, what are their goals around participation? So what are their hopes with regards to returning to home and work environment? Um, with regards to returning to driving, their goals around transporting the wheelchair and any leisure and social activities that they hope to return to. So what we would say to people coming through the clinic and for you listening today, um, before you choose a new wheelchair, you need to have a think about what, what are your goals for the chair and what do you hope to, to achieve with that chair? So think about things like, how independent are you with your pushing ability? So are you independent indoors or outdoors? Or do you need somebody to push it for you? 
think about do you need more supportive components for the chair so do you need to say a more supportive backrest for the chair to in order to keep your body upright and in the middle do you need a headrest for travel as john has discussed earlier or do you need a headrest for use in, when the chair is being tilted do you need a tray to take the weight of your arms very important we're going to talk about a little bit later what's your ability like to pressure relieve because again if you can't independently pressure relieve and effectively pressure relieve during the day that will dictate the chair that is prescribed for you this so is one of the considerations when you're selecting a chair can you transfer into a car so can you transfer physically onto the car seat plus or minus with assistance and again if you can transfer onto a car seat and your goal is around returning to driving that chair will will have to have a very different function and type to to a person that say will be transported in the back of a wheelchair accessible vehicle or whose chair will go into the boot again think about how how are you going to transport this chair so do you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle or is the chair going to go in beside you in the passenger seat if you're returning to driving or is somebody going to give you assistance to load it into the boot what's the goal around that think about what's your environment set up so in terms of your work and your home environment where are you going to be going in the chair so think about things like what's the ramped access the door widths because obviously the door widths will need to be taken into account when you're thinking about your seat width and the camber of the chair as we'll discuss a little bit later I think about things like what's the terrain like particularly outdoors so again if it's quite rough terrain or I suppose lots of uneven surfaces then that may influence your choice of tires and caster size as we'll discuss a little bit later um, think about what's your funding resource for this chair so is it going to be purchased through the medical card is it a private purchase through uh, your own funds or is it through health insurance and again I suppose a lot of the health insurance plans will have a ceiling in terms of how much you can spend so it may not cover the cost of say a very expensive air cushion a third party backrest and a chair so check with them do your homework first so we're going to talk now about the different types of wheelchairs that are available and the four that we're going to focus on are tilt and space folding frame fixed frame and power chairs and again some of the considerations as to why somebody might go for one of these different types of chairs so in terms of what what guides us one of the things that guides us when we're selecting uh, the type of chair for an individual is obviously their level of spinal cord injury and within that their level of Asia classification of injury so broadly speaking the likes of a high cervical injury such as this picture here at the top the c4 injury would be known as tetraplegia which means that all four limbs are affected including their trunk so for this individual they will not have the ability to push or pressure relieve independently they're going to need a high supportive tilt and space chair and they're going to need assistance to pressure relieve if they're in a manual chair for the likes of a thoracic injury say the level of t6 in this injury you can see that this person has preserved upper limb function their trunk is partially affected so they're likely to need a more supportive backrest than just a standard backrest but they will have the ability to push the chair themselves and then the bottom picture the l1 injury or paraplegia for this individual their legs are most affected but their trunk and sitting balance is not impaired and their upper limb function is not impaired so thus this level of injury will mean that this person has a very high level of wheelchair skills and thus will have very different requirements when it comes to their wheelchair versus somebody that has a higher level of or say cervical or a thoracic injury tilt and space wheelchairs we've just touched on there briefly so they're for people that cannot propel by themselves have none or very limited trunk balance so they need the full support from a backrest so in all likelihood a contoured support of backrest with a high back and a headrest they need to have a tilt function as shown in the picture on the left so you can see in this picture the chair is tilted which allows the person to passively offload their 
the pressure underneath their sitting bones and thus gives a new supply of blood, oxygen and nutrients to the, the tissues there underneath the sitting bones. So the advantages would be that these are most mostly highly adaptable and supportive and are can provide you with a passive change in position. So the next type of wheelchair we're going to talk about is the cross folding wheelchair. So you can see in this picture the the mechanism whereby the chair folds is this cross folding brace underneath the wheelchair. So you catch the seat in the middle, it simply folds in the middle and you can pop it into the car booth. So it's very compact in terms of storage and it's easy to put into a car boot is one of the advantages. In terms of the type of person that would get this type of chair in the, the rehab hospital, it's I suppose, quite a mix of individuals. So it would be for people that have some in, some ability to propel themselves indoors. Um, they may be a full-time user or a part-time user and in all likelihood will need some assistance to push the chair outdoors. They're able to perform independent pressure relief and as you can see from the two folding foot plates at the bottom, the chair is most appropriate for somebody that's able to do a standing transfer. So if the goal is to do a standing transfer, then a flip up foot plate is one of the important features to look for in your wheelchair. Um, one of the big advantages as well would be, besides being set up to be, um, I suppose, friendly for people that are, I suppose, using it indoors and for attendant propulsion as well. So that's where somebody else would help you push the chair outdoors. You can get very lightweight models. And the, the second advantage would be that a lot of the models are very modifiable. So you can configure them to be set up by their axle position to be very efficient for propulsion and very lightweight. The disadvantage of this type of wheelchair would be because of the folding mechanism, it's not an appropriate chair for somebody that wants to independently return to driving and to lift the chair in and out of the car seat themselves. So for that type of for that type of individual, we would recommend a different type of wheelchair, and that would be the next type of wheelchair, a fixed frame wheelchair. So fixed frame wheelchair is a single piece rigid frame. Um, the advantage would be it's lightweight and that there is very little energy lost in the frame movement, unlike the what would happen, say, in the cross folding mechanism on the previous chair. So because of this, it's very easy to propel. It's easy to turn. So it's most appropriate for the likes of a full time high level active user with good wheelchair skills. They, they need to be able to perform independent pressure relief. Generally speaking, they're able to do a pivot or a lateral transfer. And again, their goal is really around returning to independence and driving. So that would be the type of individual that typically would get a fixed frame wheelchair from the National Rehab. And then one other commonly prescribed wheelchair, probably less common than the other types would be an attendant propelled transit wheelchair. So the indications for this type of wheelchair would be somebody that has very good trunk balance, but their upper limbs are, are much more affected than their lower limbs, so say, such as in the likes of a central cord syndrome. So it's designed for people that can walk, but need the chair only when they're fatigued. Or conversely, it might be for somebody whose environment at home is set up that their doorways are very narrow, that they can't widen them. And this is the only way in which they are going to gain access to their home environment. And obviously getting home and getting into your environment is, is critical for people when they're leaving here. So if that's the, I suppose, the chief block, then we will look at this type of wheelchair for that individual. The advantage, as we've discussed, so it's narrower because it just has the transit wheels at the back, so it doesn't have the large rear wheels. And again, it's compact for storage and for the car boot. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Shandar to talk to you about how to choose components from your wheelchair. Hi everyone, uh, Sander is my name. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist working here with Orla. Um, half time of my job is in inpatient spinal cord injury rehabilitation, the other half here in wheelchair and seating clinic at the NRH. Following on from what Orla has spoken, <laughs> we're now moving on to choosing the component parts. And this is equally important. 
um, that we want you to get involved in selecting the parts, every component part that is shown on a picture on the left hand side. Um, picking every component part rightly is very important, as important as picking the right model, right, right type of wheelchair. The seat, the seat width, depth, the backrest height, the height of the foot plate should be set appropriately for you, otherwise you won't have a good posture support in your wheelchair. Um, um, if you are, um, if you are, you tend to fall on one side or flex on one side, when you're propulsing the wheelchair, you won't be able to get a straight line. So you would need a more supportive backrest to keep your trunk in the midline. That is in combination with um, a proper set of cushion, the right type of cushion, the right type of contour, and that's going to give you a more straight midline and that's going to affect your propulsion. Coming on to the tires, the big tires you have a choice of solid or pneumatic which is air. Um, so there are pros and cons for both of them. And uh, so one of the things is that if you have lots of spasticity in your legs or trunk and when you're pushing outside you tend to find that you are in lots of spasm in your legs, your feet keep slipping off the foot plate, then you should go for an air tire because it gives you more shock absorption when you are over rough ground. On the other hand, if you are worried that a puncture, because the air tire is a little bit high maintenance, because the tire could puncture, and you'll have to <laughs> give the air pressure right by pumping the air from time to time. So if you're worried about this maintenance and you live alone, then you might choose a solid tire, which gives you peace of mind of no puncture, but it's slight, slightly bumpier outdoor <coughs> and in outdoor pushing. And then the push rim, there are different types of push rims. You have aluminum, stainless steel, and different types of shape, shapes of push rim. And so some of the feedback we get recently is that some people find the stainless steel a bit better to grip on. And if you have poor upper limbs, especially the cervical injury um, <clears throat> people, and you have good, uh, poor grip, you can also have covers on the push rim. One more important thing here is the spacing of the push rim, how far from the tire it has to be set at the right space. If it's too close, your thumb, your, <clears throat> your thumb side of your palm could start rubbing onto the tire, so that might not be good. At the same time, if it's too wide, widely set from the tire, it increases the footprint of the, the wheelchair. It becomes wider, so doorways needs to be considered. One more important part there is, let's focus on the front two little wheels. They're called casters. If it is too small, then when you go out, you can feel every cracks and every little potholes. So you might, when you're pushing fast, your wheelchair might be unnecessarily stopped. Um, uh, and on the other hand, if the caster size is too big, and you don't have much room between the foot plate and the front wheels, so the heel of your foot could be rubbing onto the casters. So from our experience that the uh, um, caster size of five and six inches usually work for most of the self-propelled people. Um, so those are the main things. Uh, there are so many other, again, the different types of brakes, different types of push handles, everything you need to be involved in deciding what's best for you. Um, so, and that also the front frame hanger, the hanger of the angle of how the foot plate comes down, you can set it at 60, 70 degree, 80 degree or 90 degree. The most common ones are 80 degree and 90 from our experience to set the angle of your feet at the right place. Okay, now let us talk about how do we set up the chair. So after selecting your component parts and the model of your wheelchairs, one of the crucial thing here is that um, setting up your wheelchair appropriately for you is very, very important. You might buy the most expensive chair and the most light chair, but if the setup is not right, you're not gonna be sitting right, you won't be able to push properly. 
So the setup, when we say setup means this, the height of the seat from the floor, the relationship of where your hand is when you put your hand on the push rim, all these are very, very important. One simplified way of finding out is that you, after your, your wheelchair is set up, you, you sit on the wheelchair upright, drop down your two hands on the side of your wheels, and as a general rule, your, the tip of your finger should be touching the middle of the wheel, which is called the axle. Excel, the axle is the point where the wheel goes into the frame. And that gives you an approximate idea if it's touching, your fingertips are touching, it's at the right setup. Um, the angle, when you put your hands on the push rim, at the top right hand, right middle, at the top middle, uh, that middle, as in the picture on the left hand side, um, just focus on, kindly focus on where this man's hand onto the push rim. Okay, now let us talk about setting up the wheelchair for you. Uh, we call it configuring the wheelchair right for you. And even if you buy the most expensive chair, the most light chair, if the setup is not right, you won't be sitting right and you will, you will find it difficult to propel. So the setup is really, really important. When we say setup means the, the seat height from the floor should be appropriate for you. Um, the, the, the relationship of, of where your hand is in the push rim is very important. Where you put the rear wheel in relation to the frame of the wheelchair is important. To simplify what I'm saying, when you, after your wheelchair is set up, sit upright on the wheelchair, drop your hands down on the side of the wheels. As a general rule, the tip of your finger should be touching the axle of the wheel, which is the middle point in the wheel where it goes into the frame. Your, that, your fingertips should be touching there, and that gives you, you an idea that the wheelchair is set up right. Let's focus on the picture on the left hand side of this man where he places his hand on the push rim. It's at the dead center at the top of the push rim. When you place your two hands there, the angle that you are creating there in your elbow should be between 100 and 120 degrees. Like again, I said, measuring this angle is kind of not going to be very easy. So the simplest way to find out is drop your hands on the side. And it again depends on your wheelchair skills. If you find that you're tipping too much, in order to improve the stability, you might have to move the axle backwards to improve the stability. And John Turner has mentioned in his talk as well that as you move the axle backwards, the wheelchair becomes more stable, but the pushing becomes more difficult. As you move the axle forward, it becomes easier to push, but it becomes more tippier. So finding the balance about how much you can balance and how easy it's for your propulsion. So the setup has to be right for you. And in spinal cord injury, there's lots of studies about in the <clears throat> upper limb injury, shoulder injury for long-term wheelchair users. So uh, we want to stress that the setup has to be right so that the, the pressure that is continuous pressure that's going through the shoulder is reduced as much as possible by two things. One is the setup right and also that your wheelchair skills are right so that you know the, the, right, the right technique of wheelchair skills. So in here in the NRH, in spinal cord system of care, we also provide lots of wheelchair skill trainings every week. Now we're going to talk, let's just talk about wheel camber. What is wheel camber? Wheel camber means that your real, real big wheels are angled in. As you can see from this picture, the bottom becomes wider, but the wheels come closer to you at the top. The advantage of this is that because you have a wider base of support, your wheelchair becomes more stable. You feel more stable on the wheelchair and uh, the <clears throat> push rims are coming closer to you so your pushing becomes easier you can push in a straight line a lot better you can maintain straight line pushing a lot better and when you are turning right to left or taking a u-turn it takes very little effort with camber and um, another advantage is that when you are going through restaurants or 
tight tight hallways the first thing on the lateral side on the side that is going to hit obstacles is the bottom of your wheels mm -hmm. so you're not going to be hitting off your hands so you're protecting your hands from having some camber there are some disadvantages of having a camber so if you do excessive camber then the top part of the wheel is going to start rubbing into your body so avoid excessive camber and also the bottom part becomes a lot wider so you might find it difficult to go through narrow doorways restaurants offices schools etc in general rule from our experience two to three degree of camber is usually good for um, people using a wheelchair for full time I'm just going to gather my head for the power chair a little yeah. bit and then go on. How is it? Yeah, it's good. I don't know how many minutes have passed now. Oh, the so time is... Oh, the time is... Let us talk about power wheelchair now. <clears throat> just to, again, just to recap that the NRH wheelchair seating clinic only provides assessment, prescription and fitting of manual of wheelchairs. We don't, we don't provide assessment of power wheelchairs here because we don't have the resource or the funding here. In the NRHs for power chair, two pathways are happening right now. We acknowledge that for those of you who are very high level spinal cord injury, doesn't have the capacity to propel the, a manual wheelchair. Um, we are talking about very high level, we call NRH and CRC pathway. So, the NRH hospital therapist and the central remedial staff, we agreed to come together and run a clinic here once every six weeks. And on that day, we see selected very high level cervical injury patients, four patients are being seen. Again, this service is not only for spinal cord injury, it's for across the hospital. So we choose uh, four patients or three patients and an assessment happening here. These are the patients who can't use their hand at all. So your dry, their drive mechanism will be either using their head movement to drive or using their breath to drive or using scanning system with their eyes and using a combination of switch. So C Central Remedial Clinic has technical know-how of programming, setting up, all that kind of thing. And the NRH knows the patient where in relation to posture, sitting, and everything. So the two come together and do an assessment. This is usually done in <clears throat> conjunction with the community occupational therapist who, are, who would be providing home assessment, doorways, locality assessment, etc. And then following the assessment, <clears throat> a report sent to the community services for funding. If the funding is successful, the fitting of the wheelchair takes place in the central remedial clinic. And we also run, we are also aware that there are people who can use a joystick. Um, however, they, their, <clears throat> their ability to prepare a manual wheelchair is either very limited or they are unable to, but they can use a normal joystick of the power chair. For this, we do not need to call in the central remedial clinic. So the treating therapist here gives the patient the skills training here that we have power chairs available in the NRHs for you to practice how to drive a power chair in tight corners, through your room, through your bathroom, outdoors, etc. The skills training is done here. And then a discussion happens with the community occupational therapist um, for looking at this post discharge from the NRH, the community occupational therapist, then <clears throat> follow up this with assessment of your home environment, your locality, and if it is deemed clinically important for you, they go ahead with the funding process. In this in this one, usually this funding for a wheelchair <clears throat> usually takes place post-discharge from the NRH by the community OT. For these patients, you will definitely get a wheelchair, a manual wheelchair, and a, and a cushion from the NRH before your discharge. When choosing a power wheelchair, there are different drive modes that I just want to touch base. There's the <clears throat> rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, and the mid wheel drive. And in generally speaking, the mid-wheel drive gives <clears throat> very little turning circle, so it's usually 
uh, you can turn in very small spaces. So it's usually very user friendly for indoors. Um, and also it can be used in outdoors over hard surfaces, nice footpaths and in shopping centers, offices, etc. But if you're thinking that you're going, your need of departure is more outdoor, more climbing curbs, more hilly, then you might choose a rear wheel or a front wheel drive. These are just showing the different types of controls. The first one is joy, standard joystick. And you need to have some hand function, at least wrist movement and shoulder movement to be able to use this. If you are unable to use your hand, you're looking at the other options below. The switch control here, you can attach the switch in your head called the head ray, and you can use your head neck movement or head movement to drive a power chair. There's also touch, touch pad to available for driving. Again, if you have very little finger movements, you can also use this. If your upper limb is more weaker than your, your lower limb, foot control options are also available. The button picture here is driving a power chair with using your breath called sip and pop. Um, this option is very good if your neck movement is very limited and you can't use your head and also you can't use your hand. <clears throat> Currently, we have a patient driving a power chair very successfully using this sip and pop option. Let us talk about power assist and power pack here now. Um, <clears throat> the power assist is not a full power chair. Power assist means it is a manual wheelchair to which you add power parts to assist your propulsion. So you can switch from power mode to um, <clears throat> a manual mode. And there are different types available in the market. The pros are that you, you when you're tired, this is usually for active users. When you're tired, the power mode takes over and you conserve your energy and fatigue management. You can also um, <clears throat> take apart and put in the boot of your car. So one of your family members can put it in the boot of the car. So the transportation is a bit easier. Whereas in a full power chair, you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle. There are also cons on this. Uh, it is not as robust as the full power wheelchair. It might not be too, too user friendly to, for very uphills and rough, rough grounds and things like that. There's also compatibility issues. Not every power pack is going to be compatible with every model of the wheelchair. So you need to be careful when you're selecting. So a thorough assessment trial is important. If they're not compatible to each other, your wheelchair can get damaged or you can be thrown out of the wheelchair. So it needs proper assessment before you consider one of these. So before we move on to cushion selection, we just want to touch base on prevention of pressure injury because this is very, very important because there's literature showing that spinal cord injury population, a high percentage of you um, suffer from pressure injury at some point. I know that there are lectures already done by nurses on this, so I'm just going to focus on pressure injury in relation to sitting. But I also at the same time want to show you this pyramid of what causes pressure injury. You can see in from this pyramid that the hierarchy, the top at the top there is pressure and shear. So pressure injury means pressure, pressure is the cause, prime cause. So you need to offload the pressure to prevent that. So you, when you're sitting in a wheelchair, you need to think about how to offload the pressure. In spinal cord injury, there are Prime factors that expose you to get the pressure are reduced mobility, um, and there's bowel and bladder incontinence. So um, those are the big issues. And also the third one is impaired sensation or full loss of sen sensation in your sitting bones. And, and other factors to consider is nutrition, hydration needs to be proper and your general well-being of keeping up with the exercise, bowel, blood, continence management. But again, I want to focus that pressure there in the hierarchy is sitting at the top. So if you're sitting on a wheelchair, you need to think about how you're going to offload that area, which I'm going to show in the next slide. Okay, when, you, when we are sitting, most of our body weight is coming, the top part of our body weight is coming into a very small area, which is the seat bones, which is lying at the posterior part of our sitting area. So you can imagine that if you're sitting for long, 
and that area is only covered by a small tissue covered by skin on top of it and it, if that is under sustained pressure they're not getting enough nutrition hydration oxygen supply so then the skin starts damaging so the plan here is pressure and we need to offload that so the picture top is showing there that the, the man is leaning forward to offload that pressure if you have poor sitting balance you can go near a table and lean down on the table as in the next picture if you can't do the leaning forward position you can lean on the side but as in the bottom picture but in this case you need to do twice right and left side if you're very high level injury and you poor trunk you won't be able to do any of this so you need a tilt and space wheelchair where you can tilt back so when you're tilting back your wheelchair the pressure the weight that comes down to your sit bone is now transferred to your backrest then that area is offloaded for complete offload of your um, pressure from your sit bones you need 45 degree of tilt in your wheelchair studies shows that let's focus on the top one there picture where the man is leaning forward the studies show that the best effective method for uploading the pressure is the forward leaning position if you can do it there is a study done in spinal cord people living with spinal cord population that when a tissue and a skin is under pressure and you offload that there's a study done that records how long does it take for that tissue to get normal level of nutrition and um, oxygen perfusion, normal fluid, everything that needs for that area. It takes approximately two minutes to come to normal level. So you can imagine from this study that offloading for a few seconds is not going to be helpful. So you need to lean forward for two minutes. You need to lean to the table for two minutes and stay in that position for two minutes. Or if you are tilting your wheelchair, it should be at least two minutes. And however, patients who are using a tilt and space wheelchair, normally your trunk balance is poor and you get tired from sitting upright. So as part of the pressure you're leaving, I always advise that lean back, tilt back for a good 10 minutes. It gives you a chance of position at the same time uploading the pressure from your sit bones. So this is really, really important message to do uploading while in the sitting. There's audit done last year about what areas the most commonly um, uh, common uh, that people are having pressure injury it's the sit bones it is the sacrum and the coccyx that area so it's in the sitting of loading this pressure every hour is very important so we're going to talk about the cushion next I'm going to show you this table here let's focus on the top and um, green uh, horizontal line these are showing the top uh, the cushion types, the materials form to air. As you move to the right hand side, the stability decreases. The form is the most stable, the air is the least stable. And what you're looking for is to achieve when you're selecting to <coughs> a wheelchair, uh, the cushion. Uh, let's focus on the, the column on the left hand side, uh, vertical down. What you're trying to achieve is this feature, posture support, pressure relief, Reduce, the, uh, reduce your shear reduction and <clears throat> find a way of your moisture dissipation and heat dissipation and you want to be lightweight and you want to be you want to have cheap cheap in the in the cushion so that's what you're looking for in discussion with your therapist and nowadays there are lots of different types of cushions where you can have a combination of form and air so stability the hybrid versions or form and gel so you get pressure relief as well as stability so my colleague um, Ola is going to talk to you in the for most commonly prescribed cushions and show you the models and pictures next thank you Ola thanks Shander so as Shander has said foam is one of the options in terms of cushions the advantages would be it gives good postural stability for sitting, for your alignment when you're sitting. It's quite a cheap material and it's lightweight, so it's a good option for people that want a lightweight cushion to, I suppose, transfer in and out of the car. Some of the commonly prescribed brands are listed above. 
the big disadvantages with foam would be, I suppose, foam is an insulator, so leading to heat buildup, so poor heat dissipation over time, and also it can soak up moisture. So it's not for everybody, but it can be very useful for some for some individuals. Fluid or gel cushions, um, lots of different brands available. Some of the commonly prescribed ones from the NRH should be listed above. You can see that they are, uh, that they, okay. So fluid or gel cushions are the next type of cushion. Uh, some of the commonly prescribed ones are listed at the top there above. Some of them can be very heavy, so particularly the likes of a J-Balance or Flotex Solution or Flotex Solution Extra. The disadvantage would primarily be um, that they can bottom out, and by bottoming out, what we mean would be if the person isn't kneading the gel at the back before sitting into the cushion, then their sit bones can actually push the gel away from the seated area leading to the person sitting with very little gel under the, the sitting bones, so thus negating the whole point of having a gel cushion. So they do require some maintenance. The plus side would be they're really good in terms of pressure and shear reduction. So they are a popular choice, but again, I suppose they're not for everybody. So it just depends on what your needs are. Air cushions then, so the commonly prescribed ones from the rehab are shown below. So going from left to right, we have a Rojo, we have a Starlock, which are full air cushions. We have a Vicare, third picture from the left, which is a different form of air. So form of air triangles within the cushion cover. Um, and then on the right hand side, a, a hybrid Vicare, so a Vicare Active 9, so it has the air at the back and then foam at the front for more stability. The big advantage of air would be because it offers good immersion and envelopment, so the person sinks in and is kind of hugged by the cushion when it's properly set up for them. They do provide high pressure relief, so they're a common choice for somebody that's coming off extended bed rest for a pressure sore in the rehab. They do provide good heat and moisture dissipation, but the big disadvantages would be A, they're very expensive, and B, they're a very low stability cushion. So for somebody that needs a lot of postural support to sit or is quite unstable, they're a difficult choice. Lastly then, the Supercore or Stimulite is the brand cushion. It looks like plastic, but it's actually a flexible form of aerospace honeycomb. The pros would be they're very good for pressure relief, for heat and moisture dissipation, because you can see all these channels that the air and the moisture can flow through, so from top to bottom. They're a good choice for somebody that sweats a lot or has continence issues because they're a fully washable cushion. So you can wash them in your washing machine or alternatively, you can actually wash them in the shower. So have them all rinsed through and then let them dry before putting the cover on again and sitting on it again. The negative would be it's an expensive cushion. So I suppose you can see that there's lots of different types available and it comes down to an individual assessment as to what's priority for that individual and what, what are the goals, what are you aiming to target with the cushion. So to sum up, we would say that one size chair and cushion does not fit all. It comes down to an individual assessment. And that individual assessment needs to take into account the person's posture, their function and mobility goals, what environment they're going to be using the chair in, and how are they going to transport the chair. So a super light chair, we wouldn't say is necessarily best for you. So you can actually get a chair that is set up very well for your needs, but you need to think about what's the configuration of the chair and what are the components of the chair because they will all influence how the chair performs and feels to you. Um, you need to practice regular pressure relief techniques so it's not just the cushion that will negate all the pressure concerns. So you have to be doing pressure relief techniques regularly during the day. And then we would say to always involve your local therapist in choosing your correct equipment. So your local therapists are contactable via the local health office um, for repairs or for a second chair when, as and when you need one. We're at the end of the phone if they have queries in relation to cushions or something about your prescription, they will already have your file after leaving the NRH. And I suppose just we would say that it's important to have kind of a therapist, not just the supplier involved in choosing the equipment, just to have an unbiased 
opinion really for the prescription and we would say that a reassessment should be done when the user develops any secondary complications so things like pressure injury or changes to your posture while you're sitting in the chair so i'd like to thank you very much for your attention and i think there's going to be an opportunity for some questions thank you mm -hmm.